we also see, we also see in Isaiah a new, a new exodus and a new, a new creation. So one of, the, one of the most prominent themes in Isaiah, especially 40, so I, I, should stop, I should stop and say, you know, because I haven't done this specifically, I should stop and say, right, chapters 1 through 37, just to get our bearings, Isaiah is a huge book, isn't it? So chapters 1 through 37, right, are about Assyria and Jerusalem being preserved, right? Big picture, we all want to see the big picture, 38 through 66, I take it, Isaiah's one book by one author, incidentally, um, but Isaiah 38 through 66 is about Babylon, isn't it? So, after, and especially after exile. So I take it, I take it that um, Isaiah 38 through 66 is much of its prophecy, right, of of what's to come. That's what um, I keep having problems with this, don't I? That's what separates. Is it getting too far away again? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, that's better. But Isaiah uh, 38 through 66, what separates Yahweh from false gods is that he knows the future, that he can predict what will happen before it uh, takes place. But anyway, Israel's going to be exiled to Babylon, and Isaiah 40 through 66 promises there's a new exodus, right? And there's a new creation coming. So the, the first exodus becomes a type and a pattern of a new exodus, a second exodus. This exodus will be from Babylon. So, so a, a big theme in, in, in this part of Isaiah is Israel, Israel is coming back. And, uh, and, 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 and when it comes back, there will be a new creation. So when, when you have, an, so let's look at some of these themes, right? The, the blind will see and the deaf will hear. Well, that's the new creation, isn't it? Uh, of course, we immediately start thinking of Jesus, though, when we hear, hear this, don't we? The desert will become fruitful. There'll be no more enemies. There'll be no more sickness. The desert will blossom like a crocus, which is a flower, right? We, again, the blind, the deaf, and the lame and the mute will be healed. There'll be streams in the desert. The ransomed of the Lord will return and come to Zion. That's the new exodus, isn't it? That's the return. Israel will be forgiven. There's going to be a highway in the desert, right? Those are the words, right? We're not reading these, but those are the words of John the Baptist, aren't they? You're going to return. The new exodus is the gospel. Proclaim good news to Jerusalem. Remember that? What is the new exodus? It's the gospel. The good news, Jerusalem will be delivered. Israel will be delivered. It's The blind are going to be led. You're going to turn darkness to light. You're going to make the rough places level. Is the, the new exodus is Israel's redemption. God's going to do a new thing. He's going to make a way in the wilderness. That's returning from exile, right? He's going to part the waters as in the first exodus. He's going to bring Israel from the ends of the earth for the glory of his name. Well, the ends of the earth is returning from where? From Babylon. Again, Isaiah 51, Israel will leave Babylon. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. The wolf and the lamb will lie down together. The serpent will be crushed. Aha, uh -huh, there it is, right? There's our promise. The serpent's going to be crushed in that new creation. At Isaiah 65, 25. There's going, to, there's, going to be a, there's going to be a new exodus. There's going to be a new creation. There's going to be a new Jerusalem. Jerusalem's going to shine. Anticipating Revelation 21 and 22. The wealth of the nations will go to Jerusalem. Israel's sanctuary temple is going to be beautiful. The Lord will be your light. Jerusalem will be restored. It won't be forsaken. Now, 
We're going to leave some of this until we come to the New Testament in terms of how it's appropriated. But here, here's the point I want to make. Was this promise fulfilled? Yes. They came back, didn't they? 536 B.C. They returned. But, yes, but, right? What's the answer? Yes, but. Yeah, or even yes and no. Was the promise fulfilled? Yes, but not in this way, right? They came back, but was it the new creation? Um, were all these promises fulfilled to the extent that we see here? No, and they weren't. They weren't. We'll come back to that again. Because these promises are stunning, aren't they? I mean, these new creation promises. But even the new Exodus promises, they're not fulfilled in their fullness. So we'll come back to that. Now, here's, here's the other thing, just big picture again. Why was Israel in exile? What does, Jer what does Isaiah say over and over and over again? I'm not, I'm not looking at the text because of their sin, right? Why were they in exile? Because they sinned. For them to return, see, they failed to keep the Lord's law, right? But Isaiah 40 through 66 says they're going to return because Yahweh is going to forgive their sins. He, but who is the servant of the Lord? The servant of the Lord plays a huge role here. And I'm sure you're all familiar, but you, Israel, my servant. So the servant songs play a huge role. Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen. So Israel, Jacob's just in the Hebrew parallelism, right? You're my servant, Israel. Clearly. He says to the people. Um, Isaiah 45, 4. My, my servant Jacob, and Israel, my chosen one. We see that again. Israel is a flawed servant. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf like the messenger I'm sending? Who is blind like my dedicated one? Uh, the blindness here is a moral failing. Israel is God's servant, but it's a flawed servant, sinful servant. The Lord promises to save his servant Israel, and they'll be his witnesses. So the servant is clearly Israel, but the servant also... The servant is Israel, but the servant transcends Israel. The servant, you're familiar with these passages. The servant is endowed with the Spirit, and he brings justice and light to the nations. He won't break a bruised reed. So that's a, that's a great passage, isn't it? 42, 1 through 4. I love that passage, which Matthew appropriates, doesn't he? How, how is the servant going to bring victory you're not going to hear his voice in the streets. You know, it's the ancient world. You, well, it's in the modern world too, right? Warfare's in the streets. It's not going to be like that. He's not going to, he's not going to even break the bruised reed. The, 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 the wick that is flickering and about to go out, he's going to preserve it. So you, you all know that book by Richard Sims, The Bruised Reed. Have you all read that? That is a great, great book. That's a very pastorally warm book. So if you haven't read it, it's a very short little book. You can get it in the Puritan paperbacks uh, from Banner of Truth, Bruised Reed. Read that book. I mean, just for pastoral ministry, read that book. You're going to find it very, very strengthening for yourself and for your people. A great, great meditation on this text. So Israel is the servant, but Israel... But the servant transcends Israel because the servant's going to 
the servant's going to bring Jacob and the remnant back to the Lord. Israel can't bring itself back, right? Do we have an exegetical, hermeneutical warrant for saying the servant transcends Israel? I think we see it right here. The servant's going to bring Jacob back and bring the remnant back to the Lord. In fact, Isaiah 53, and I don't need to linger on this, the servant, the servant atones for the sins of Israel. Well, Israel can't atone for its own sins. You know, you, you all know, you know, if you, I mean, I've, I've had students do this. I haven't done it myself, but they go talk to Jewish rabbis about Isaiah 53, and they say, it's Israel. It's Israel. It's not, it's not about Jesus. It's about Israel. And now, I've, I've even had students surprised at this, if they haven't studied, because they take them to the earlier passages in Isaiah, and they say, the servant's Israel. It's not Jesus. It's Israel. <laughs> So, um, yeah, Isaiah 53 is talking about Israel. Yeah, it is talking about Israel. But the servant is Israel, but transcends Israel. Because it makes no, Israel can't atone for its own sin. And furthermore, we have a lot of exegetical reasons. The servant's innocent. <laughs> Israel's the, uh, Israel is God's servant is in, in his ex, is in exile. Isaiah tells us over and over and over again for their sin, right? They're in exile for their sin. But the servant, this servant in Isaiah 53 is not suffering for his own sin. He's bearing the sins of others. A sinful Israel can't atone for the sins of Israel. <laughs> and, and this is not sinful Israel. So you've you got to account for that. I mean, you, you could say Isaiah is just contradicting himself, right? First he says they're sinners, and now he says they're innocent. But clearly he's drawing a distinction. It's the servant who atones. Now, this is what I want to argue here. I want to argue that what we're seeing here in Isaiah is what we've seen all throughout the Old Testament. We see the, 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 the blessings going to come through the offspring of a woman. The blessings going to come through the offspring of Abraham. But it's Isaac and not Ishmael. It's Jacob, and it's not Esau. And it's Samuel, and it's not Hophni and Phinehas. I, I'm just speaking generally now. It's David, and it's not Saul. It's the remnant. It's not the disobedient. But finally, it's the servant. It's the servant. Individually. It's Jesus. Who is the true Israel, finally? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Isn't that what Paul says in Galatians 3.16? Is he just making it up? Who's the only seed of Abraham, finally? Well, the only one who ever obeyed. That's who. Paul's just not pulling that out of the air, right? The only true servant at the end of the day is the only one who ever obeyed. And who was that? It's in Isaiah itself. It's the only one who can atone for the nation. Finally, forgiveness comes through an individual servant, the true Israel. And, and, and there's indications that the servant is tied to a royal figure. So he's the son of David. The servant, the servant is the king. So, so we see that narrowing. This servant is the one endowed by the Spirit. So So he's the king, right? Chapter 11. So you see the connection Isaiah makes? The king in chapter 11 is endowed by the Spirit. Well, so is the servant. The, both the king and the servant bring about the new creation. Isaiah 11, the king and the new creation. See that theme in Isaiah 11? King and new creation. So too in Isaiah 40 through 66, the servant and the new creation. So he's telling us the servant's a king. The servant's going to fulfill the covenant. And therefore, the promise to Abraham that the blessing would go to the ends of the earth is going to happen through the servant. Did Isaiah fully understand what he was saying? I don't think so. Does it violate what Isaiah says? Certainly not. I think Isaiah, Isaiah understood part of what he said. But it's a prophecy fulfilled and a mystery revealed. Certainly, Isaiah didn't understand totally what he was talking about. So, 
all kinds of passages, all kinds of passages in Isaiah about the inclusion of the Gentiles, right? Gentiles will stream to Jerusalem. The return from exile. Now, yeah, people interpret this different ways. I see this fulfilled in the New Covenant. In Isaiah, when he says the law will go forth from Jerusalem, I understand that to be the proclamation of the gospel from Jerusalem from the day of Pentecost on. Egypt and Assyria are included. Do you remember that? In, in chapter 19? So, the kings will understand. David will be a witness to the nations. On and on it goes. Uh, uh, so many passages. Let, let, let me just read one of them. Sometime, some passage we, we might not get to, but come together, come gather together and approach you fugitives of the nations, those who carry their wooden idols and pray to a God who cannot save, have no knowledge, Speak up and present your case. Yes, let them consult each other. Who predicted this long ago? Who announced it from ancient times? Was it not I, the Lord? There is no other God but me, a righteous God and Savior. There is no one except me. Therefore, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. There's the nation. For I am God and there is no other. So we see that universal call for all to be saved. Well, so many things we could talk about in Isaiah. But just hitting those high points. Anything you want to say? Yeah. Israel is a servant, right? Yeah. Um, so how do you figure out which passages about the servant refer specifically to Israel and which ones refer to Jesus in the future? And how do you differentiate which ones are which? I would say every passage that says Israel is the servant refers to Jesus as well unless it says the servant sinned in those passages, right? When he talks about the sin of the servant, that's got to be restricted to historical Israel. All the other passages, I would say, because Jesus is the servant. Jesus does represent the nation. Then the passages that cannot refer to historical Israel are the passages that predict forgiveness of sins through the servant and the passages that say he will restore Israel and the passages that say he'll, he'll bring in the Gentiles. I think none of those can refer to ethnic Israel because that, those blessings will only come through a, an obedient son. And for Isaiah, I think that means perfect obedience. If you look at the streamline of biblical theology, what's the story? It's not David, as good as he was, because he was flawed. There is no other person. It's not Moses. He was a sinner. So the, the blessings, the covenant blessings that are promised, they only come through Jesus. Uh, that, that's what I'd say. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? They only come through the perfect servant of the Lord. Of course, that fits very nicely with the New Testament, doesn't it? Any comments on Isaiah? Yeah. I'm curious, you say that Isaiah didn't really understand all of what he was saying. Would you see, in terms of an authorial intent idea, his intent is kind of what's immediately there, and then God... Um, I know you said you don't want to drive away between obviously God's intent and the authors, but God has more of the picture, obviously, and so it's there even though Isaiah doesn't see it. Or no, I mean it's an interesting question. That clearly, Isaiah teaches that there's a servant of the Lord who would forgive our sins. Did I? I'm, I'm just asking. Did Isaiah really understand fully what he was saying? Maybe he could have. But I don't think he had to. I mean, at least from 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, we seem to have an indication that the prophets didn't fully grasp all that they were saying, but they looked forward to the fulfillment. But I think things were clearer after the fulfillment. Um, so this is a hard question, isn't it? I'm not arguing 
that the fulfillment is such that I, I think I think it's the it's it's sort of like um, when it's fulfilled, Isaiah would have said, "Aha, that's what I was saying all along." Of course, that fits with everything I was saying. But did he see the fullness of what he was saying? Probably not. But he, but but nothing that was fulfilled was contrary to what he was saying. He wouldn't have said, "Well, that's that doesn't relate to what I was saying in my book at all." I mean, that's that's just totally separate. So there's an in, in, an integral, organic relationship. But in terms of his own consciousness of the fulfillment, it, it's a little bit hard to know. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Anything else on that? Okay, let's do Jeremiah. Jeremiah, is Jeremiah the longest book in the Old Testament? Isn't that true? Uh, yeah, I'm reading Jeremiah right now in my devotions, and man, those some of those chapters are long. I mean, great, right? But it's a it's a long book. So um, I try to read. Uh, you know, I try to read. I don't always do this, but I try to read. My Bible, and I know everybody's different, right? I try to read for my devotions. I try to read one chapter in Psalms and Proverbs in English every day, two chapters in English in the Old Testament every day, one chapter, I, uh, one chapter in the Greek New Testament every day. I've done that since 1976. That's a great way to learn Greek, right? Just read it. No, it depends on where you are. And then I, and I try to read. I don't always fulfill this one. But I tr most days I do, though. Depends on what's happening. But I try to read one chapter every day in the in the Hebrew and the Alex X. And uh, but I but I put that one up. I cheat. Don't tell your Old Testament professors. But I cheat. I put it up in parallel. So I put it up on Bible Works. And so I don't know if I pass an exam, but I put up the three windows: the, the Hebrew, the Alex X, and the English. And when I get stuck, you know, I look things up or I actually cheat. I look over the English. So, yes. so if it works, it's okay, right? That's totally my ethic, you know. So <laughs> whatever works is right. <laughs> so I'm kidding, of course. Okay, so here we see the dates in Jeremiah, judgment and restoration. We want to get the big picture of Jeremiah, don't we? We have we the, the nation is exiled for covenant violations, for forsaking the Torah. I think you know if you're going to read, you know if you want to help people understand Jeremiah, just read chapter two. Chapter two is a beautiful and powerful description of the nation's alienation from Yahweh, and what does he basically say? The nation is a whore. You're a harlot. You're married to Yahweh and you've abandoned him. So it's the sin is whoredom. Do you know about Ray Orland's book, um, God's Unfaithful Wife? The first edition was titled Whoredom, but it didn't sell. <laughs> and uh, you know, the old days, I, I have a dinner like once a year if Ray's in town with Ray and Wayne Grudem and a couple other people. And, I remember when Ray was writing the book, and he, I mean, obviously it's a serious book, but we'd say, what are you working on? And he said, I'm working on a book on whoredom, <laughs> which is a very great book. But, you know, finally the publisher said, people just aren't buying this book because it has the title whoredom on it. Um, but it's true, right? That, that's, that's, it's a, it's a great book. I recommend it to you, uh, Ray's, it's a good piece of biblical theology. What a good reminder that, that, that apostasy from the Lord, it's personal, right? It's a personal defection from God. Uh, he uses the image, they don't cling to Yahweh. And I, I mean, there he's using the image of underwear, right? The prophets, you never know what they're going to do. As underwear clings to you, that's how you were to cling to Yahweh, and they didn't do it. So they, and of course, this shows up. They don't care for the poor, the aliens, the widows, the orphans. They're stealing, murder, adultery, lying, and idolatry. What do you think of when you hear that? This is a very simple question. What do you think of when you hear that? Stealing, murder, adultery, lying, and idolatry. The Ten Commandments, right? Clear, 
evident covenant violations. They offered their children in sacrifices. Oh, well, we don't do that today, do we? Or do we? Think of abortion, right? It's not convenient. The child's not convenient. Not so different. The sin is like leopard spots. The sin is en engraved on their hearts. You speak, you know, uh, Jeremiah 4, 23 through 26 is like a decreation. You know that passage? It's like the world's going back to not being created again because of Israel's sin. And, of course, the nations are judged as well, so very powerful. Um, Jeremiah has a lot of uh, interaction with the leaders in Israel. Very personal book. He indicts kings, priests, prophets, and the wise. A lot of indictment of the kings, um, especially for social injustice. We see, we see Jeremiah being persecuted. He's beat and imprisoned. They're lobbying for Jeremiah to be killed. Um, people are saying he's preaching a false prophecy. You know, it kind of makes sense. Jeremiah is saying, the Babylonians are going to win. We should surrender. And people said, he's a traitor. He's betraying our nation. That's, that, those were the charges. He's actually, you know, you imagine that in real life. He's actually dispiriting our army. Come on, we're in a battle. We have this guy over there saying, surrender. <laughs> uh, but that's what God was saying, right? Surrender. Surrender. You're, you're not going to win. Your, uh, because of your sin. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah, often called the weep, weeping prophet, Jeremiah basically says as well, I wish I were never born. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't marry. He's, he's a gentle lamb. He's not inflicting violence on others. Um, at times he doesn't want to prophesy, but then he tells us, the, the word of God is his joy. It, it just possesses him to, in such a way that he has to speak. Right? It just takes over his life. So um, through it all, the Lord protects him. He calls on the people to repent. That's the covenantal call. Break up your fallow ground. That's a nice picture of repentance or cut off the foreskin of their hearts, right? Another picture. Other images are used. And then, like all the prophets, Jeremiah talks about a restoration. 